Juke and Media strikes again. Tyrone Magnus and the DMCA's difficulties with parody fair use. Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we are once again jumping into the world of viral video licensing with the internet's favorite viral video licensor, Jukin Media. Now, if you're not familiar with that name, you should know that Jukin Media has been around for a while. They basically collect license rights to these videos that you might otherwise see as memes on Reddit and elsewhere on the internet. But at least recently, it has come out that they are sending out letters, putting out copyright strikes using YouTube systems against prominent YouTubers, or at least medium-sized YouTubers, that are using their videos in various respects as reaction videos. Uh, I've pulled up now a video that I did last week on this very topic called YouTube's MXR Plays, Fair Use, Extortion, and the Muddy Middle of Copyright, which I do recommend you check out. We talk about some of the issues we're going to talk about today in that video, and also note, it's going to be potentially this channel's first 100,000 view video, which is which is pretty cool. I, I wish it were in better circumstances. I wish we were talking about things that were perhaps a little bit more uh, a jolly uh, and, and not so negative on some of these folks. Uh, but in that video, we talk about fair use, whether or not the use of it in these commentaries uh, is what's happening uh, under the law, and honestly raise some questions as to whether MXR plays would actually fall under fair use and whether Juke and Media even if they are shady and using the law in a way that maybe we don't like, uh, are perhaps in the right in, in certain legal respects. And certainly there are other folks that have talked about that on YouTube now, including Lawful Masses and Leonard French, which I've talked about before. There was also a Legal Eagle video uh, that went up yesterday that talked about this, where he actually called out this channel, and we thank him for it, uh, where he and I disagree a little bit on the nature of whether or not Juke and Media's uh, language and communications with MXR Plays could be considered as extortative. Uh, but if you want more on the extortion question, check out this video, uh, check out that Legal Legal video, check out a question and answer video that, that we did uh, on this topic uh, earlier. But we're going to talk about something a little bit different from extortion, because what we've got now appears to be uh, a YouTuber that is experiencing the first section of what was the MXR Plays story. So as it came out in the comments to that video that I just showed you, MXR Plays had actually received uh, a letter from Juke and Media some time ago that said, hey, you need to get a license for some of the clips that you're using, and if you pay us, we'll go away. And they did that. They paid it. They didn't hire a lawyer. They didn't have a discussion about law uh, with Juke and Media. And then it was only after that, after they showed that they were willing to pay on certain things, that they were willing to respond to Juke and Media's requests and cease and desist letters, that they got that $6,000 check uh, or, or invoice that then they went to YouTube to claim as extortion and that we talked about and other YouTube lawyers have talked about. Uh, but as of yesterday, uh, it was raised in my comments to that video and on my social media that this had happened again. So this is a YouTuber by the name of Tyrone Magnus. And you can see this is bigger than MXR plays in terms of size. He has 1.7 million subscribers. And as we talked about in the earlier video, one of the things, if you're a licensor, if you're going to go and you're going to do this, you're going to go after people for uh, copyright infringement, is you want to make sure that you're going after people that you think, if you're Juke and Media, have a pile of money that you can go and that you can claim. Not necessarily millions of dollars, not necessarily go buy a beach or a private island money, but enough money that it's worth your while to pay either your in-house or outside counsel to craft a cease and desist letter, letter and otherwise put pressure on these people. So at 1.7 million subscribers, I would say that the assumption is that this person, Tyrone Magnus, has this money. So as this was linked to me, I decided that I would take a look at his video. I went through it all. Uh, and you see, I've I highlighted a specific section here because I want to talk about it. Uh, but to give you the context here, what he is claiming to have done is to take another YouTuber's videos that he describes as parodying those videos, and then to take those parodies and then to comment on them himself. Uh, and one of the main functions of this video is for him to say, hey, Juke and Media put a copyright strike on my video, which is different from a copyright claim, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But basically, YouTube allows a kind of middle ground between strikes, uh, which require the video to be removed and count as essentially a knock on your channel that if you get three of, you're probably going to get removed from YouTube entirely, and a middle ground that says claim. 
Uh, and there have been videos on the Hoag Law YouTube channel that have been claimed, particularly our Game of the Year videos, where we use trailers and trailer music and trailer sound. Uh, and if you go and you look at the Resident Evil 2 video that we did on our channel, uh, that was claimed by Capcom because they have the trailers and they have the music. And I didn't care. It's about Game of the Year. Uh, but they could have, because they claimed copyright infringement, they could have issued a strike, a DMCA takedown notice and YouTube would have uh, obliged them uh, and that would have counted as a mark uh, against the channel. So one of the things he's saying here is, hey, I've gotten these claims from Juke and Media before, some of which I think are silly, uh, but when you get a claim, one of the things that YouTube allows you to do is to go in there and scrub the areas that would otherwise be claimed and you can do that even before you publish um, as a for instance we had another video that I did that talked about uh, Star Wars uh, and the Rise of Skywalker and again we used some trailer footage we didn't have sound in that specific one but there were actually a couple claims in that video that were from the NBA of all things which I believe had the exclusive rights to maybe the trailer or the commercial and it wound up in removing a, a minute and a half uh, or so before it was published and so this YouTuber, Tyrone Magnus, says, hey, you know, that's usually what I get. I get a claim. I go and I scrub. Uh, why did this happen to me as a strike now? Because that's a significant problem. And Juke and Media going and asking for this money and saying, hey, we will remove the strike if you give us this money. Uh, and we've talked about extortion. I recommend checking out the earlier video. Again, if Juke and Media has the legal rights to these videos, it's probably not extortative to have a copyright strike issued. The DMCA language, which we're going to talk about in this video, specifically allows for copyright holders to go claim infringement, seek to have them taken down uh, from service providers on the internet. So probably not extortative to say we're going to take that, we're going to have that strike, we're going to make you take that video down unless you pay us retroactively for the license. But the question that we want to talk about here is how the DMCA interacts with the nature of fair use and parody. So this gentleman says, hey, I used this other person's videos that were under... Tyrone Magnus's understanding parodies. Now, I went to this channel that he said he took from, and I can't necessarily find anything that I would describe as parody, but one of the difficulties with these kinds of issues is Tyrone's video has been struck, so I can't find it, I can't analyze it on any kind of individual basis like we could with the MXR Plays videos, but I did find these Tony Baker uh, videos where he adds voices to what appear to be meme clips, which might be what we're talking about. I couldn't find anything else that might fall under this description, but if you're familiar with the old show, America's Funniest Home Videos, uh, it was very often done where Bob Saget would do a voice of a dog doing a funny thing or things along those lines, and this appears to be similar in nature to that. Whereas in America's Funniest Home Videos, I have no doubt that they had uh, disclaimers and licensing a way of rights when you sent in your video because they had lawyers on their side and it was a multi-million dollar operation. I doubt very much that Tony Baker went and got any kind of license or permission rights to use this cat video or other videos where he talks over uh, various things. Uh, but this, I believe, was described by Tyrone as a parody. And certainly there's an argument here that it's transformative, especially you're talking over the whole thing. You're making it into a different kind of humor. That would be something that is up to a judge if it came to it. And we've talked about it in the past. We're going to look at the fair use factors again in this video. But ultimately, fair use is a kind of affirmative defense that this would be infringing but for falling under these categories and hopefully balancing towards fair use and not away from it. So when you hear somebody like a YouTuber like Tyrone Magnus come on and say, this was clearly fair use, this was clearly parody, you have to question the premise because even a lawyer like me, even a lawyer like Legal Eagle or Lawful Masses or anybody else on YouTube or you know in the real legal world outside of YouTube uh, can't tell you what is going to be fair use at the end of the day because this all lives in a judge's mind based on specific facts and circumstances that are going to require a detailed examination of both the initial kind of creative work and the creative work that is claiming fair use on top of it. And because of that, you can't, if you're a YouTuber, if you're anybody else that's working with somebody else's intellectual property, you can't just sit back and say, this is definitely fair use. You can feel confident that it should be. You can feel confident that if you had to go all the way to the end of a trial, you would win the day. But before that happens, you would have to go through that process. And so I looked at Tyrone Magnus's website. I couldn't find anything that looked specifically to me like uh, 
parody, like a costumed commentary, like things with graphics. This was a video that appears to be the kind of thing he was likely talking about with respect to this other set of videos. He's got a try not to laugh here with some clips from, in this particular case, Married with Children. He does this with a number of other kind of old media properties. And the question would be, you know, is this fair use? And certainly if he did this with the uh, other uh, cat videos or other videos from that other website that we just talked about, would that be fair use? And we would have the same analysis that we did with respect to MXR plays, which is, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you could convince a judge, maybe you could convince a court that your face uh, being the, the large majority of the screen here is not designed certainly to be a substitute for this. You wouldn't go and watch Married with Children in this format. Uh, it is commercial insofar as you're selling ads. Is it transformative? And is it transformative, especially in this context where it's try not to laugh, where the only quote unquote commentary or critique is essentially watching these two people and whether or not their faces change? Uh, it's possible, uh, but it's harder than to actually have a commentary, to actually have this paused and to be talking about the nature of his dress wear and how it informs the scene in a very interesting or funny way. That's different than sitting there and trying not to laugh. And I think you've got a harder case to make in this particular instance. Now, Tyrone does bring up the fact that, hey, we're now two levels removed from where the infringement might have occurred, right? Because Tony Baker has this video where he's putting voices on a cat or perhaps doing something else. Again, we don't have the original Tyrone Magnus video to react to, but he's doing it. If he's right and it's a parody, then we're clear of the Juke and Media claims. So what we're doing now is we're assuming Juke and Media has the right to that cat video. We're just assuming it for purposes of this discussion. Juke and Media has those rights. Tony Baker comes in and does a voice under kind of commentary that makes it funnier, that does something different, that it actually appreciably changes, transforms the clip. So now it's fair use, now it's not infringing. Then Tyrone Magnus comes in on top of it and comments on the voiceover of the cat video. Now it's a commentary on a parody of an initial video. Does that give you extra protection? I think the answer is maybe, but the copyright law isn't designed to give you kind of protection status just by the n number of levels removed from the initial infringement. So if, for instance, Tony Baker is infringing, then your commentary on it is infringing to the level that you didn't have the license to begin with. Now, you get six steps removed, you get eight steps removed, you get 80 steps removed on the internet, you start to have real problems in kind of controlling this, and the courts aren't likely to hit the person that's the 80th step removed from the initial infringement. But ultimately, you still have to kind of do that analysis of where the infringement occurs. And the one thing I will say on this, I said this in the Q&A, is people talk about orphaned works, people talk about things that you can't identify. Those aren't things to your benefit. The way the Copyright Act works, the way copyright in general works, and you can disagree with the entire premise of copyright if you're so inclined, is that once a creative work is put into a fixed medium, once it's a video, once it's a photograph, once it's a book, once it exists, that copyright is held by someone, the creator. And even if you can't identify that creator later, you are infringing on that if you don't fall into another protected category. We talk about fair use because that's the one that doesn't require you to actually engage with the creator. That's the one that YouTubers rely upon. But at the end of the day, the very first analysis you should make, if you're making a video on YouTube, if you're otherwise talking about these things or otherwise using someone else's intellectual property is, if it is not yours, it is somebody's. And so you are infringing on their work by making a derivative work based on it unless you fall into the fair use category, unless you license it, unless you have some other reason for being allowed to use it in that manner. So when you've got a commentary like this, you see here I've highlighted, it's false, you do not have to get permission for commentary or for parody. That's true, if you fall under fair use, you are no longer infringing. But the fundamental issue is and continues to be that that is an affirmative defense to infringement. So someone can come along and they can claim that you are infringing. And unless you can guaranteed fall under the fair use umbrella, you're going to be into a certain amount of trouble. And in this particular area on YouTube, the thing I wanted to raise in this video, because it's not obvious, is that the nature of fair use that we talk about regularly in virtual legality in respect of this 
is such that because it's a balancing test, because it's purpose and character, nature, amount and substantiality of the portion used, effect of the use on the potential market, because it's all of these balanced facts and circumstances, it's very difficult for you to claim up front that you fall under that bucket. And it's relatively easy for someone that actually owns the intellectual property to say that you don't. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about here, because we talked about it briefly in the Q&A, but not in the original video in respect of MXR, is that Jukin has been down this road before. So what we've got here is a motion denying summary dismissal of certain claims that were made against Jukin for making claims on this other person's uh, videos on YouTube. And this specific person is called Equals 3. I think it's Equals 3 LLC. But we get some informed discussion of what we're talking about here with respect to that transformation factor in respect of fair use. And so the court here says... The key inquiry for the first statutory factor is whether and to what extent the new work is transformative. A new work is transformative when it does not merely supersede the objects of the original creation, but rather adds something new with a further purpose or different character, altering the first with new expression, meaning, or message. So you start to think about that initial video. You've got a cat video doing something funny, and you add voiceover to it. Is that transformative? I would argue that it is definitely more transformative than a mere reaction video. And so you start to say, okay, perhaps so. Additionally, the Supreme Court has stated that parody has an obvious claim to transformative value. A parody is a work that uses some elements of a prior author's composition to create a new one that, at least in part, comments on that author's works. Determining whether Equals 3's episodes parody Jukin's videos is a difficult and nuanced task. So when we talk about the cat videos in particular, they don't appear to be parodies. Now, again, when we make this video, we have the problem of saying we don't actually know what videos Tyrone Magnus was responding to because they're not on his channel anymore. They have been struck. But if they are just the voiceovers of meme videos, it's hard to see those as parody. If they have some more elements, if they have costumes and graphics and satire and things that go along with that that comment on the nature of videos, maybe the nature of meme culture and connection with those videos, and maybe on Jukin Media in and of itself, those could all fall under parody. And then, yes, the more transformative it is, the more likely you are to fall under fair use. Of course, with the main problem being, in order to prove that, you have to get up to this level where you've got federal courts actually opining as to whether or not you have fair use, and you've probably paid lawyers a goodly amount of money. Which brings us to the next point in this video, which is to say, okay, he can't definitively say that he's parody. He can't definitively say that he's commentary. He can't definitively say that the video before it was parody. So what is YouTube to do? Right. One of the complaints that he has, he talked to his YouTube representative and they say, well, we can't really do much for you on this particular score. One of the complaints that he has is that YouTube essentially acknowledges the strike and then the strike goes on. The video is removed and now you're two strikes away from being removed from the channel entirely. And one of the things that has popped up a number of times in the comments on virtual legality to the MXR plays video to the Q&A and elsewhere on my channel is, you know, what culpability does YouTube have in respect of all this? And one of my comments has been that YouTube isn't necessarily who I would blame for this particular chain of events, right? There is undoubtedly abuse that is happening here. I can't tell you whether the Jukin Media videos that they are specifically claiming fall under fair use or not. I can tell you what I have looked at so far suggests that they aren't necessarily being crazy with their claims, that the things that they claim for MXR plays, the thing that they might have struck uh, with respect to Tyrone Magnus would appear to broadly fall outside of fair use if they are just commentaries of other videos. Uh, even if there is a parody element on the video initially, you've got a certain amount of infringement issues. And certainly, if I were Jukin Media's lawyer, I would say, I think you have uh, a substantial belief that it could be outside of fair use. And that's going to get you very, very far in the way the laws are written right now, which is what I wanted to talk about. So what I've pulled up right this second is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And in particular, the section that we always hear about, which is about takedowns. And if you're not familiar with this, we've talked about it in virtual legality before. But basically, this is how the YouTube system operates. This is also how it operates if you go and you can complain about infringement on Facebook or on a game that's been released that is infringing on your game on Steam or elsewhere. Uh, and here's how it works. It says, 
a service provider, so when you see service provider, you should think YouTube, shall not be liable for monetary relief, money, uh, or accept as provided elsewhere for injunctive or other equitable relief. They don't have to take it down. For infringement of copyright, by reason of the storage at the direction of a user of material that resides on a system or network controlled or operated by or for the service provider, if the following. So let's, let's shorten that. YouTube won't be responsible for damages for co contributory copyright infringement if the following happens. So if you're not familiar with this, YouTube is a service provider. They, they provide all these videos to the world. If this didn't exist, the argument would go, if somebody puts up something that's infringing, if they put up the entirety of Ghostbusters uh, and they just say, hey, it's for you, and they don't have any affiliation with Sony or anyone else that might own the rights to Ghostbusters, then YouTube could potentially be liable for the infringement by allowing a user to go and do that. And YouTube and the internet on the whole doesn't have the mechanisms to go and police everything that somebody might put up. And the legislature essentially decided, hey, a freewheeling internet is a good for society, and we don't want to have these companies that are otherwise providing this faculty for people to com to participate in this dialogue to have this liability, because that would be too much. And everybody would go after the big pockets. They would go after YouTube. They would go after Steam. And so we want to give this protection. So it says, you won't be liable, YouTube, for contributory copyright infringement if you don't have actual knowledge of the infringement. So if you actually were YouTube and you stumbled across the copy of Ghostbusters, yeah, you got to take that down because that's obviously infringement. In the absence of such actual knowledge, you're not aware of facts or circumstances from which infringing activity is apparent. Uh, news items about all these infringing videos that are up on YouTube that you as somebody that has control of YouTube sees, that's also a problem. Or upon obtaining such knowledge or awareness, you act expeditiously to remove or disable access to the material. So if you come across this information, you get rid of it. You're not going to be copyright infringing because you're doing the best that you can with the tools that are provided to you. But here's where we really care. You also won't be liable if upon notification of claimed infringement, note that this doesn't require actual infringement. That's important. As described in paragraph three, which we're going to get to, you respond expeditiously to remove or disable access to the material that is claimed to be infringing or to be the subject of infringing activity. So that's what we call a DMCA takedown notice. So when YouTube goes and gets a letter from someone, and we're going to see what the elements of that letter have to be, that claim infringement, if YouTube takes it down expeditiously, then they're going to be okay. They don't have this liability. The function of this is to say to YouTube, if you have any desire to get out of contributory copyright infringement liability, which of course YouTube does, and you get a letter that follows these elements of notification in paragraph three, you take down that video or you otherwise, what YouTube does is they also add a strike component to it and you move forward from there. Now the strike issue is YouTube's alone. They, that comes separate from the DMCA, but note what YouTube has actually done here. YouTube has said, yeah, we can strike, we can take down, that's easy enough. But people complain about the fact that Juken Media does a strike here and not a claim. The claim system is essentially YouTube trying to soften the blow of DMCA takedown notices. It's actually a fairly unmitigated good that YouTube has provided that has essentially solved some of the issues with the DMCA. Now, you can talk to lawyers of all stripes and, and some will tell you, Sometimes solving the issues with what are inherently bad law is a problem uh, because it doesn't get fixed on the ground floor. And you could argue that with respect to YouTube. Uh, but the claim system allows for someone to come on, essentially issue a DMCA takedown notice, but agree that as long as the advertising money comes to them, it doesn't have to be taken down. And YouTube doesn't issue a strike. So like the Resident Evil 2 video that we talked about, Capcom gets the money from the whatever it is, 96 viewers uh, that watched my Game of the Year videos. Thank you to... Thank you to those 96 or whoever, uh, whatever that number is now. Uh, but that they watch those videos. Capcom gets all the, the massive amounts of money uh, for that. Uh, and that's essentially fine. Uh, and that there are a number of YouTubers that say, okay, I would argue as a lawyer that my use of what Capcom put together there is uh, fair use. Uh, you know, it's advertising material. Uh, I could make a good claim for how it's transformative based on my critiques of the game and how uh, it's it's uh, not at all competitive with what they would otherwise be trying to sell since they're not trying to sell their trailers, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not interested in that fight. I really am not interested in uh, collecting the 23 cents that are probably attributable to that video in any event. But I don't need to get into that fight because the claim system exists. So that's pretty good. But here's what actually happens. And you'll see this language mirrored 
in what YouTube asks for for people that are going to claim infringement. It says to be effective under the subsection to actually require YouTube or Steam or whoever to take down what you're claiming to be infringed. A notification of claimed infringement must be a written communication provided to the designated agent of a service provider that includes substantially the following. You have to sign it. You have to identify the work. You have to identify the material that's infringing. You have to give information reasonably sufficient to YouTube to contact the complaining party. Uh, and here's the kicker. I've highlighted it in yellow. A statement that the complaining party has a good faith belief that use of the material in the manner complained of is not authorized by the copyright owner, its agent, or the law. In other words, they have to go and they have to certify to YouTube that what they are claiming not only is infringing, there's no way it couldn't be infringing, that there isn't a license right that the person that has put it up on YouTube could have. And most importantly, that it's not authorized by the law, as we see at the end of that sentence. And there was a fight that we talked about very briefly in the MXR video about what exactly by the law means. And I've pulled up here now the case of universal versus lens, which establishes what the standard is with respect to acknowledging fair use and a DMCA takedown notice. So we've got some legal language here. I apologize for that. I'll try to shorten it so that it's clear and distinct as possible. But it says, we must first determine whether the specific act requires copyright holders to consider whether the potentially infringing material is a fair use of the copyright under Section 107 before issuing a takedown notification. The section of the DMCA requires a takedown notification to include a statement that the complaining party has a good faith belief that the use of the material in the manner complained of is not authorized by the copyright owner, its agent, or the law. The parties dispute whether fair use is an authorization under the law as contemplated by the statute, which is so far as we know an issue of first impression in any circuit across the nation. Now, this is a few years back. This is 2015, as you can see from the heading there. Uh, fair use is not just excused by the law. It is wholly authorized by the law. And they talk about a few things that Congress said about Section 107. The statute explains that the fair use of a copyrighted work is permissible because it is a non-infringing use. So we talk about it as an affirmative defense, and it is, but it's an affirmative defense that acts kind of differently from other affirmative defenses. You know, you think of criminal affirmative defenses as justifiable homicide, right? You definitely murdered that person, but it was okay for some reason under the law. That's not how this works. It's not that it is infringing, but for, it's that if these things qualify under the balancing test for fair use, you are no longer considered to be infringing. And the court uses this to establish that it does mean that authorized under the law includes fair use. It says, given that 17107 expressly authorizes fair use, labeling it as an affirmative defense that excuses conduct is a misnomer. Universal concedes it must give due consideration to other uses authorized by law, such as compulsory license. And even if, as Universal urges, fair use is classified as an affirmative defense, we hold, for the purposes of the DMCA, Fair use is uniquely situated in copyright law so as to be treated differently than traditional affirmative defenses. We conclude that because Section 107 created a type of non-infringing use, fair use is authorized by law, and a copyright holder must consider the existence of fair use before sending a takedown notice under Section 512C. So we've got the whole universe of DMCA situations now, right? If you are going to go send a takedown notice, you have to consider fair use before you do that. But there's language there, right? We talked about good faith belief. The primary thing that you are going to assert under the DMCA is your good faith belief that it's infringing. So ultimately, this court case backs off this kind of premise a little bit. So we see here it says, we must next determine if a genuine issue of material fact exists as to whether Universal knowingly misrepresented that it had formed a good faith belief that the video did not constitute fair use. This inquiry lies not in whether a court would adjudge the video as a fair use. It doesn't relate specifically to what the law might say. And again, that's because we can't know what a judge will decide. Fair use is impossible to kind of guess at beforehand. But whether Universal formed a good faith belief that it was not. Contrary to the district court's holding, Lens may proceed under an actual knowledge theory, but not under a willful blindness theory, which is a little bit of extra legal language. But ultimately, what this stands for is the fact that, yes, you have to consider fair use, but you can form a subjective notion of whether or not something falls under fair use if you are the uh, intellectual property holder on your own, as long as it's good faith. 
And good faith, if you're familiar with the law at all, if this isn't your first trip to virtual legality, you know is a kind of equitable notion. What is good faith? You now have to prove if you are the claimed infringer and you don't want the takedown, you don't want the strike. If you're Tyrone Magnus, you now have to say, Juke and Media, this is fair use. And Juke and Media says, nah, uh it's not fair use. We thought about that, actually. We did some memos uh, and we concluded that it's not fair use. And ultimately, you're liable to be stuck. As this paragraph says, Universal faces liability if it knowingly misrepresented in the takedown notification that it had formed a good faith belief the video was not authorized by the law, i.e. did not constitute fair use. Here, Lens presented evidence that Universal did not form any subjective belief about the video's fair use one way or another because it failed to consider fair use at all and knew that it had failed to do so. Universal nevertheless contends that its procedures, while not formally labeled consideration of fair use, were tantamount to such consideration. Because the DMCA requires consideration of fair use prior to sending a takedown notification, a jury must determine whether or not Universal's actions were sufficient to form that. To be clear, if a copyright holder ignores or neglects our unequivocal holding that it must consider fair use, it is liable for damages. If, however, a copyright holder forms a subjective good faith belief that the allegedly infringing material does not constitute fair use, we, the court, are in no position to dispute the copyright holder's belief. So in essence, the DMCA is premised on the subjective notions of the copyright holder at the harm to the alleged infringer. And when we look about this, when we look about the net effect of this, the it's practically obvious. When you take Universal and Lens and you take the DMCA, you see what we now see with Juke and Media. As long as you, as Juke and Media, prep a memo and put it in a folder that talks about the four factors and why they are all balanced your way, or three of them are balanced your way, or they're tied, but the two that are more important are balanced your way, the court is saying, we are in no position to determine whether that met your good faith belief standard. It's subjective to you. So you have to hand wave. You have to do a few motions. You have to put a few things in an electronic file folder on your internal server. But otherwise, if you do those things, you are allowed to be wrong. And honestly, you're allowed to be very, very significantly wrong and still issue that takedown notice, which of course incentivizes the business model that you can media now finds itself in, incentivizes the actions that they have taken, such as initiating a YouTube strike, asking for money, and then asking for more money based on different videos uh, at a later time. And that's the situation we now find ourselves in. So I talked about that in the title to this video that this is the nature of the DMCA, but in my opinion, it's a nature that really does need to change, uh, at least if the legislature, society, at large, maybe the world at large outside of the United States, determine that reaction videos uh, and things like what Tyrone Magnus put together, things like what MXR Plays put together, are an important thing to have for society. And obviously in the comments to my videos, uh, there are different discussions about whether or not there were those are low effort uh, or those are otherwise problematic and shouldn't be rewarded under copyright law. Those are important conversations as well. The one thing I will leave you with on this is that it's important always when you're thinking about laws, whether they're reforms, whether there's something new, whether there's something old, to think about what we talked about in this video, which are, I think, primarily unintended consequences of how they operate, right? That good faith belief standard and the fact that fair use and Section 107 aren't even discussed at all in the DMCA have resulted in court cases that have led us to this point. And yeah, it can be anticipated in hindsight, looking back in 2020, literally and figuratively, but it isn't necessarily something that could be anticipated at the forefront because a lot of these laws are dealing with highly technical areas, areas where the legislature maybe isn't that familiar with what is even a product that people might want. And whether or not something should be infringing is something we need to look at in the internet era. And so I think copyright reform is necessary. I think DMCA reform is necessary. And I think ultimately universal versus lens is something that we need to take a look at as to whether a purely subjective, absolutely untestable conclusion that fair use doesn't apply should get you to the place that you issue a DMCA takedown notice because unfortunately the DMCA liability shield is so powerful that YouTube and Steam or whoever are going to take that thing down. And if you are the large chip stack at the table, if you are the universals of the world, or even the Juke and Medias of the world, you're going to issue this notice. YouTube is going to listen to you. And then you've got people that might well fall under a fair use argument 
at your discretion. You have all the leverage in the world. And I don't think that was ever the intent of the DMCA. I don't think that was ever the intent of Universal versus Lens, how all this is supposed to operate. I don't think it's in YouTube's best interest. And you might see YouTube flip around on some of this in the next couple of years uh, if they see a lot of creators having a lot of difficulty with this. But in that state of affairs, uh, I think it's something that needs to be looked at by a lot of people. I think reform is necessary. Uh, and that's what I have to say about this issue and this latest video and claim uh, from Juke and Media. This has been Virtual Legality for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please like, please subscribe, please share it around with anybody that you think might be interested. We're talking about these kinds of things all the time. This is going to go into a playlist called YouTube at Large, where we talk about issues related to the terms of service and YouTube and COPPA and all this other stuff. We are also starting to uh, experiment uh, with a new format. We're going to have a live episode on Saturday of this week where we're going to talk about uh, the videos that we did this week. We're going to talk about comments and questions that were raised by those videos. Please hop in, check it out if you are at all interested. It's going to be at 1230 Eastern. So whatever time zone that might be for you, uh, absolutely come in, leave a comment. Maybe I'll get to your question. I have no idea how many people are going to participate, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be fun. Uh, otherwise, if you saw this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it in its podcast form, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.